Uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction, uh, Mariam uh, Manteri, dear uh, old friends, and uh, also to um, Furuz Masrur for having taken the initiative to invite me. It's a, a pleasure to share with you some thoughts uh, about uh, spirituality uh, and service um, in the global age. And as the title of the talk represents, um, I'm uh, trying to frame the question of spirituality, uh, not just in terms of self-actualization and fulfillment and happiness, but in terms of the survival of humankind. And the theme which I wish to uh, explore uh, briefly tonight, and I will um, try to be brief so we have an opportunity for a conversation so I too can learn from you, is the question of why in a period where we have unprecedented prosperity uh, in uh, the history of humankind, we face not just increasing alienation, stress, anxiety, uh, depression, substance abuse, the unraveling of our uh, social uh, relations, a, a kind of what I call psychic pandemic, a mental health crisis in our bubble of privilege and prosperity. Um, but also why all of this progress has brought us to the shadow of catastrophic climate change, where future generations have to think about the threat of mass extinction, which is why um, I would like to draw a connection between the culture of consumerism and materialism, which we so long have worshiped, uh, and the uh, uh, position that we are in today when we stand on the precipice uh, with humankind about to go um, over the cliff on the path of uh, self-destruction. So I'd like to perhaps go back and uh, try and situate us in a broader historical perspective. It's very difficult for us to understand um, how exceptionally privileged we are in this generation, let alone in a country like Canada with all its uh, uh, prosperity and, and freedoms and opportunities and, and what have you. So one point of contrast is to realize that in the Roman Empire, uh, the average life expectancy, according to historical sources, was 25 years of age. So the average person would live just 25 years. In medieval Europe, life expectancy was just 35 years. Uh, and that can be contrasted um, with life expectancy today in Canada, which is about uh, 82 years. So we have almost tripled uh, life expectancy. And it's not just a matter of how long you live, but it's the quality of that life in terms of uh, health care, nutrition, access to food, uh, education, uh, self-improvement, self-actualization and basic human security, freedom from um, random uh, but ever-present uh, violence, which was also one of the characteristics of life, let's say, in uh, medieval Europe. So at what point in this historical trajectory did the idea of consumerism and consumption emerge? And I will perhaps reflect on the meaning of consumer society or consumer culture. So by way of simplification, throughout most of history, most of humankind struggled to survive. Survival was having basic shelter and just enough food to survive. Of course, there were always the, uh, uh, the ruling classes, whether it's the pharaohs of Egypt or the emperors of China or the kings and queens in Europe and, and what have you. But the masses of humanity basically struggled to survive against starvation, against disease, and against violence. And now that we are in the pandemic and you know, complaining about all the restrictions that we have, let us not forget that in medieval Europe, the medieval Europe that I just described, 
you, the bubonic plague wiped out an estimated third to half of Europe's population. So that was the grim reality of our historical past. That is the world in which our ancestors lived. Now, somewhere beginning in the 17th and 18th century and accelerating dramatically in the 19th and especially the 20th century with industrialization, which was a product of the scientific revolution, uh, the emancipation um, of uh, European uh, peoples from the backwardness and religious superstition uh, of the uh, medieval uh, period, which is otherwise known as the Dark Ages, through scientific discovery and technological innovation, uh, the process of industrialization begins, the so-called Industrial Revolution, and all of a sudden, through mass production, through the steam engine and railroads and factories and what have you, societies are able to create a surplus. So instead of just surviving, there is now a surplus of uh, income, of capital. We begin to spread the wealth more broadly beyond the elites at the very top. Uh, there is a class of uh, 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 merchants and industrialists and, and what have you. And if we look at the 20th century, um, at the beginning of the 20th century, um, according to various uh, statistics, uh, people were still using about 90 to 95% of their income to meet just their basic needs. So the idea we have today of disposable income, income that you can spend on consumption, on distraction, on things which we don't really need, but which we consume for whatever uh, purpose uh, is relatively recent. And for the most part, uh, it is a post-war phenomenon, in particular in the 1950s, uh, we have this uh, culture of consumption uh, really um, spreading the benefits uh, of unprecedented uh, economic growth and technological innovation to society at large. So let's perhaps go back and think about some of the um, belief systems which accompany this technological innovation. And of course, I'm bearing in mind here that it is European culture and European civilization um, which exports its philosophy of materialism uh, with colonial expansion to the point where today uh, people in China, people in India, people in Africa and elsewhere still look to um, the sort of Western conception of the pursuit of happiness, the so-called American dream uh, in uh, creating this uh, culture of consumerism. So one of the basic ideas of the European Enlightenment was that in order to achieve progress, the um, enlightened mind of the modern uh, society has to liberate itself from religious backwardness and superstition. And one can understand when you look at the dark ages, when the church was busy burning books and keeping people in darkness and ignorance, when in the middle of the bubonic plague, 50 million people in Europe died uh, of this pandemic. And instead of understanding basic hygiene and science, um, they were basically told that this is some sort of divine vengeance and, and what have you. From that backwardness and darkness, the idea of modernity, of ration, using your rational, intellectual, scientific facilities was indeed progressive and revolutionary. But at some point, the baby was thrown out with the bathwater. The idea was that all forms of religion, spirituality, mysticism must be eliminated because they are irrational. Max Weber, very famous uh, German uh, sociologist, 
um, used the term disenchantment. He said that modern society must become disenchanted with religious, magical, irrational belief systems in order to achieve progress. Everything must be rationalized, intellectualized, and that is the path towards progress. And there was an element of truth to that, except, except that modern technology also perfected the weapons of war, violence, destruction. In the 19th century, we had the Napoleonic Wars. In the 20th century, we had the First and Second World Wars. During the Cold War, we lived under the shadow of uh, nuclear uh, annihilation. So technological advancement um, without a spiritual and moral dimension to civilization also created a level of violence uh, in the 20th century, which made the violence of medieval Europe look um, relatively uh, tame in comparison. Now, one of the aspects of modernity is that religion becomes replaced by ideology. And whether the ideology is um, racism and colonialism, the idea that one supposedly superior race is destined to dominate inferior races, which led to uh, you know, catastrophic uh, injustices and genocides and slavery and exploitation, or the ideology of um, uh, communism, to uh, give another example, which resulted in mass murder in Stalinist Soviet Union, mass starvation in Mao Zedong's uh, China, um, or ideologies such as a nationalism, which resulted in uh, catastrophic wars with uh, millions of uh, deaths and unprecedented destruction. All of these ideologies um, eventually uh, crumbled. And if we go to the end of the Cold War with the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991, there is a sense that um, Western liberalism together with uh, free market capitalism has triumphed, that all ideologies failed except Western liberalism, except uh, free market capitalism. And in 1991, when the Cold War ended, uh, the American uh, 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 thinker Francis Fukuyama wrote a famous book uh, called The End of History. And in his view, uh, the collapse of communism was the end of history because it marked the triumph of Western civilization and liberalism and free market capitalism would now embrace the whole planet and we would all live in peace and prosperity. And if we look at where the world is today, we begin to see how much of a profoundly misguided illusion that was. Because while the end of the Cold War actually coincided also with the emergence of the World Wide Web, the internet revolution, which is barely two decades old and which has fundamentally changed our way of life in a way which is far more significant than the Industrial Revolution in Europe, which took place over 150 years. We have arguably, in the past 20 years, reshaped human society and economy and production in ways which are more profound than the 150 years of the Industrial Revolution. So while we now have a period of unimaginable possibilities in terms of human welfare prolongation of our lifespan and health and well-being, we go back to what I said earlier, a psychic pandemic, the spread of unprecedented stress on our mental health. But most important, we have reached for the first time in history the point where through the so-called Anthropocene human activity, has begun to affect the environment in ways that could bring about our own destruction. So if we go back to the 1950s, which was sort of the uh, uh, baby boom generation, the post-war generation, the beginning of uh, consumerism, 
Um, one of the books which um, inspires me is called The Art of uh, Love by uh, uh, Eric Fromm. And he observed in the 1950s that modern man is uh, well-fed, well-clad, uh, sexually satisfied, constantly entertained, uh, but experiences only the most superficial of connections with fellow human beings. I always imagine what Eric Fromm would have thought about the age of social media, um, where the uh, superficiality of the relations that we have with each other has reached an entirely different level, which perhaps explains this extraordinary level of uh, alienation that we have uh, in our uh, society. But beyond the question of um, the pursuit of happiness and now the increasing uh, uh, realization that this idea that consuming more and more material goods would bring about happiness is, is a big lie. That pattern of unbridled consumption has had such a devastating impact on the environment. And that devastating impact has been many decades in the making, except that in the 1980s, scientists began to start talking about global warming, which was met with uh, uh, indifference, if not derision. Um, and today, um, one of the most significant challenges for our survival is how we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions because it is now a scientific certainty that if we don't, uh, we will uh, have an apocalyptic uh, dystopian future. Which brings me to the theme, spirituality and service to humankind. What does this have to do with these questions which uh, politicians discuss, uh, which um, are addressed through the prism of the need for different types of technology and, and what have you. Well, it has to do with the fact that a materialistic civilization, which reduces uh, human beings to incorrigibly uh, selfish, uh, narcissistic, self-indulgent creatures, has brought us to the uh, edge of disaster. Um, we have been basically preaching, our leaders have been preaching, and we've been following the gospel of greed. And it was uh, fashionable in the 1980s, in fact, when global warming began, for political leaders, neoconservative, neoliberal political leaders, the likes of uh, Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, and others, to say that greed is good. Greed is what uh, keeps the world you know, what is it? Money keeps the world going around. And, and the more you consume, the better it is for the economy. It is patriotic, patriotic to go out in the shopping mall and to buy a whole lot of things that you don't need. So imagine now that this sort of so-called American dream is being emulated by one and a half billion people in China, one and a half billion people in India, by people in Africa and everywhere throughout the world. And you begin to see how truly catastrophic the, the consequences will be, uh, not just on humankind's sense of happiness and well being, uh, but on, on nature, on the capacity of the environment to keep our species alive. So, where does spirituality and service to humankind come in? Well, all of the structures that we have, the patterns of consumption, the theories we have about uh, the economy, uh, political system, uh, what I like to call the last ideology, the last utopia of consumerism, which is crumbling before our eyes, all of these are based on a fundamentally materialistic conception of human nature. And it is in contrast to a spiritual conception of human nature, which sees us not just as greedy, self-seeking uh, creatures waiting to consume as much as we can, waiting to accumulate as much wealth as we can, far beyond anything that we need. And let's bear in mind that today, the richest four people in the world have as much wealth as the bottom 50% of humanity. 
uh, during the pandemic, the wealth of the billionaire classes has doubled and tripled, while hundreds of millions have fallen into poverty. So we have really an obscene, unprecedented concentration of wealth. And you have to ask yourself why people are uh, becoming you know, space tourists at a time when we have to urgently think about um, how we have to drastically change our way of life for the sake of our collective survival. So going back to spirituality, what would the world look like if we question the assumption that greed is good and we come up with a new mantra that selflessness is good. Selflessness is good because it is a form of liberation, a liberation from our ego, from all of the forces that create the illusion of happiness, the illusion of success, but ultimately leave us um, empty and uh, unfulfilled and alienated. But in addition to that, um, imagine how our relationship with nature would change, how our relationship with the environment would change if we begin to understand that instead of being at the center of the universe, instead of this incredible arrogance that we have, the anthropocentric view that human beings are at the center of the universe, everything is created for our consumption, for our use and exploitation. If instead we understood, as many of our indigenous brothers and sisters do, for example, that we are just a part of creation, that we are in fact an insignificant speck in an infinite universe. How incredibly liberating is that realization? And perhaps that's the paradox of humility, that greatness is achieved through humility. Freedom is achieved through surrender, surrendering to forces that are greater than us. And I would say that today we see the um, glimmerings of this uh, spiritual thirst, this spiritual yearning for a society um, that is in desperate search of uh, purpose and meaning uh, because it is our vocation as human beings to seek that deeper sense of self rather than simply being satisfied with superficial illusions and distractions. Um, and perhaps it's a good thing that for the first time in history, we are left with no option. We're left with no option but to completely reimagine and rethink this materialistic civilization, because if we don't, we will self-destruct. And Arnold Toynbee, famously said that civilizations are not murdered, they commit suicide. So forgive me for those very stark words, but we have to now seek spirituality, a culture of service to humankind, a culture in which we achieve success through selflessness, through humility, through modesty. We have to now see that as a matter of our uh, collective survival. So um, I've spoken for just under uh, half an hour and I'm going to stop there and um, uh, I look forward to having a, a discussion with all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Akhavan. Uh, we have some questions, so I'm wondering if I can read them out. And uh, if you'd uh, be kind enough to uh, answer them or engage in a discussion with um, the person who asked it. So the first question is, science and truth have been made a mockery of today in unparalleled degrees and divisiveness between religions and political groups has reached new heights of dysfunction. Practically speaking, how can we implement a spiritual revival in the face of such total societal dysfunction and mockery of truth? Well, that's a very good and, and pointed question, but very uh, there's a lot of truth in it. 
Uh, and perhaps um, I can uh, share with you um, a sort of historical perspective, which of course is shaped by my uh, perspective um, as, a, as a Baha'i, as a member of the Baha'i community. And um, the Baha'i perspective is that um, we are witnessing today the consummation of humankind's social evolution, the emergence of a planetary civilization in which all peoples, whether they like it or not, are going to be unified in one world civilization. Um, and um, if we look at the process of globalization, it's quite recent. Globalization is maybe, you know, at, at the sort of scale that we see it today, at most a, a, a half a century old. And, and, and in a, it, it, the reason why I uh, mention this is because we see two parallel processes, two twin processes, moving humankind in opposite directions. On the one hand, we see the destruction and disintegration of an old world order based on divisive and materialistic ideologies. And I think some of the dysfunction that we see today is the crumbling of a system which is no longer fit for purpose. It is anachronistic. It is not consonant with the reality of the globalization and oneness of humankind. But at the same time as we see some very disturbing patterns of uh, uh, greed, corruption, xenophobia, a populist hatred, and, and all of those uh, uh, sort of very alarming trends, we also see the emergence of a new world order of the processes of construction and integration. Um, so we also have uh, the rise of uh, unprecedented consciousness uh, of um, human rights, uh, our relation to the environment, the importance of social justice, um, the importance of um, seeing work as uh, not just a means of accumulating obscene wealth, but as an act of uh, service to humankind, which gives us meaning and, and purpose. Just today, I was reading about this sort of uh, post-pandemic um, uh, culture in which many people are questioning the purpose of work. Uh, and unprecedented numbers of people are rejecting certain types of work and uh, focusing more on their own um, spiritual welfare and, and, and growth. So I think that, yes, there are some very uh, alarming, divisive, violent tendencies in our society, but there are also some incredibly promising ones. And it's this transition between the crumbling of the inadequate uh, uh, social systems of the past and the emergence of new ones which creates this chaos and confusion. Thank you, Dr. Akhavan. We have our next question, which is, do you see any willingness in people of influence to rethink the materialistic view? It's a very good question. Uh, I would say that perhaps there are elements even uh, uh, among you know, people of uh, great wealth and influence who themselves also are caught up with the dilemma of our age, uh, the question of meaning and purpose and whether one should perhaps use one's uh, uh, influence to achieve um, uh, some deeper uh, meaning and, and, and purpose in life. But I would perhaps ask the question, ask a question about the question, should we, become so dependent on people of influence to affect change? Or rather, should we redefine the idea of influence? Do we underestimate our own influence, our own power to affect change? Um, so my experience has been that, you know, corrupt elites um, are not likely to bring about change voluntarily. They generally will bring about change when they have no option. Uh, and in that sense, the forces of history, I think, are propelling us in the right direction, but political elites are tenaciously holding on to these uh, uh, 
old patterns of behavior because it serves their purposes. But I think it's ultimately through an awakening of the masses, through uh, shifts in our cultural consciousness that we're going to bring about these far reaching changes. So I would flip the question on his head and say, what about our own influence? What about the importance of uh, the responsibility, the agency of, if you like, the ordinary, so-called ordinary people? And change doesn't come about because in the elections we vote for this or that party. That may be important. But real revolutionary change comes through um, the grassroots. It comes in the way we reimagine relations in the family, in our places of work, in our neighborhoods. Um, so I, I guess in the 1960s, you know, the activists would say the personal is the political, um, but we now have to see that in the context of community building. And I believe that uh, this is the way that we are going to um, bring about um, a, a better world um, not just in terms of greater social justice and equality, a culture of empathy and, and care and compassion, um, but also a culture in which we ourselves are going to experience uh, deeper uh, happiness and satisfaction. And much of our life revolves not around what politicians do or say in parliament, but what we do with those that are closest to us, what we do with those who are in our own circles. Thank you so much. That's that was such an enlightening answer. Um, I uh, have the third question. What do you think about the rise of artificial intelligence in our society? Some people think that the rise of AI may split humankind into a small class of superhumans and a huge underclass of useless people. A an excellent question. And this goes back to what I said earlier about uh, technology without spirituality or morality would be catastrophic. Um, and we have seen how uh, technology resulted in uh, the unprecedented destructiveness of a weaponry. Um, and in the same way, if the benefits of technological innovation, uh, including in particular artificial intelligence, are not shared equitably, yes, we will have a dystopian future of haves and have nots. And you, you look at some of the science fiction movies of the 1920s and 30s and the early days of cinema, um, when uh, uh, I even think about Fritz Lang's Metropolis, um, which was this you know, quaint silent black and white film where, um, above the surface of the earth, the rich live in beautiful gardens, uh, uh, this life of incredible luxury and comfort. And all the workers are in a subterranean world uh, under the ground um, and they live uh, miserable lives. Uh, and of course the movie is ultimately, a, a, you know, a love story between the daughter of one of the workers who meets the son of one of the rich people uh, above the earth and it's, it's about the transcendent story of love and at the end of the day that 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 is pretty much the situation that we're in today if we don't have a culture that's based on empathy on compassion on love on caring for others we will have the greedy billionaires running the world today amass even greater fortunes but not just fortunes but amass political power we will in some respects, go back to Europe's medieval past, where you basically had warlords, right? You had powerful landowners with private armies who were exploiting poor peasants. And uh, what makes us think that we're not going to go to the day when powerful billionaires amass so much wealth that they control all the politicians, that they have private armies, that they exploit people, whether it's, you know, the Facebooks of the world or, or, you know, what have you. So yes, there are alarming possibilities uh, for the future. If artificial intelligence is not democratized, if it is not moderated by spiritual and moral values, but at the same time, 
if we do have a culture of spirituality, of service to humankind, where even the billionaires realize that serving others is a much greater path to fulfillment than dominating and exploiting them, then we could have a culture in which all human beings could live a comfortable life, have universal health care, have great schools, have all sorts of opportunities for self-improvement, self-actualization. We could have you know, two-day working weeks um, with automation, uh, and everyone uh, could still um, uh, live very comfortable and prosperous lives. So both possibilities exist, and the difference between them is essentially our, our spiritual and moral transformation. Thank you so much. Um, I have the next question. Uh, and I'm, going to, I'm just going to read it out. Uh, do you, Payam, have some wisdom about the actions of autocratic leaders of several powerful countries holding tightly to personal power, which creates tremendous harm to their and their adjacent country populations? For example, the current Russia-Ukraine conflagration. Uh, it's a very good question. I'm not sure how much wisdom <laughs> I have, but I, I think that um, uh, obviously, if we look at what is playing out, uh, let's say Russia, Ukraine, Middle East, China, uh, what you see is you know balance of power politics, geopolitics. It's ways of thinking that we've had throughout history. I mean, the first and second world wars um, happened in large part because um, you had a, a kind of, uh, a, you know, Machiavellian balance of power um, uh, uh, mentality. Um, and ultimately, what uh, nations in their power struggles could not resolve through negotiation or alliances, they resolved through aggressive war. So, um, you have on the one hand uh, NATO's expansion, which is seen as a threat uh, by the Russian Federation, and the Russian Federation is lashing out by uh, destabilizing the European Union and NATO, uh, threatening the Ukraine and Georgia and what have you. So this may be alarming for us, but it describes much of history, except that today, um, the idea that uh, Russia, China, the United States, the Europeans could somehow go to war with each other or seriously dest destabilize the world um, is even more uh, insane than ever before because of the nature of interdependence. The prosperity of all nations has become so intertwined, whether we're dealing with trade relations, the flow of uh, capital, of goods and services, um, uh, population flows, mass migration as a result of conflict and so on and so forth. So in a sense, if the leaders of the world had the slightest bit of wisdom, they would uh, understand that having uh, stability, uh, accommodating each other's interests, uh, pursuing a common interest, in particular, arresting global warming, which will devastate all countries, um, that these uh, global challenges are far more important than positioning themselves for power in you know, this or that uh, particular uh, uh, location. And I just want to say one, one last point. Um, and it, and it goes back to transformation of grassroots consciousness. Leaders, to a certain extent, reflect their followers. So until people awaken and they speak truth to power, um, we are going to have corrupt authoritarian leaders. And we see even in the Western world, which we thought is uh, always going to be democratic, the real threat, the real threat of uh, fascism, fascism in America. Uh, maybe a few years ago, that would have been unimaginable. I always tell people, I used to watch House of Cards 
now I watch CNN news because it's even more absurd what is actually happening uh, in the political sphere. So um, if we dumb down culture enough so that people think politics is like a reality TV show, well, we're going to end up with the authoritarian leaders, including in the democratic world. And just imagine what's going to happen when the effects of climate change and hyperinflation and all of those stresses accumulate. If people are not wise and engaged and educated, well, we are going to end up with very poor leadership indeed. Thank you very much. Uh, our next question is, do you think we can have spirituality without religion or without adherence to some higher power that instills in us a fear of consequence? It's a very good question. And um, I think it's a question of definition. What do we mean by religion? What do we mean by spirituality? Um, and um, uh, one of the central figures of the Baha'i faith, um, uh, Abdul Baha, whose son Baha'u'llah is the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith, um, he traveled, uh, I believe, in 1911 to the West, including Paris, London, Canada, United States. And in Paris, when he spoke about world peace, uh, the oneness of humankind, the spiritual civilization, a French intellectual said, um, I like all of your ideas, but I don't believe in God. And Abdullah's response is, well, I don't believe in the God that you don't believe in either. Uh, that question <laughs> reminds us of, of this whole question of, well, if by religion we mean much of what we see in the world today, well, I'm very much unreligious because what we associate with religion is blind obedience, tribalism, hate, fanaticism. Um, um, so perhaps we need to use a different term to explain what we're talking about. So the concept of spirituality, at least that I was brought up with in the Baha'i faith, is based on independent investigation of truth, the absence of clergy. Spirituality is a journey for every individual, and it's a unique journey rather than blind obedience to a set of uh, dogmas and empty uh, rituals. Uh, it is an ecstatic uh, journey, and, and one of my sort of favorite um, passages from the Baha'i writings is, you know, whither can a lover go but to the land of the beloved? So spirituality is seen as the relationship between the lover and the beloved, and not some sort of, you know, a dogmatic, you know, fanatical adherence to some, you know, very uh, parochial set of beliefs. Um, but we have to realize, though, at the same time, that spirituality is a very personal journey, to the point where even parents cannot control their children's journey, that we also live in community with each other. Our spirituality uh, is also dependent on our living together with others. And that goes back to the set of relations which I described earlier, family life, community life, work life, uh, and then the wider uh, ramifications of our beliefs and our relations in the political sphere, in, in the wider world. So I, I think that's why community building is so important, that communities should be nurturing our spiritual growth. And our spiritual growth is dependent on service to others. We cannot grow spiritually just through a kind of narcissistic navel gazing, or I'm going to go and do yoga in my Lululemon pants and I'll be a better person. No, you need to go out there and see the injustice and the suffering of others because it's your responsibility to uh, lovingly, sacrificially, selflessly help those that suffer in the world. So uh, that's why I, getting back to the question of religion and spirituality, I hope that this explanation uh, indicates what I was trying to convey when I talked about uh, spirituality. Thank you so much. Um, the next question, I just would like to remind everybody, if you have a question, please don't put your hand up in the Zoom. Please write the question directly to me in chat. Thank you. 
So the next question is, I can almost hear the proponents of capitalism saying that it was greed that led to human prosperity. What do you say to that? Well, there may be some truth to that. These are all excellent questions. And in its own time, uh, perhaps the, you know, the free market was an excellent liberating force. If we go back to Europe and feudalism, you know, uh, until the Industrial Revolution, you had a feudal lord who controlled the land and the peasants worked his land uh, just for the sake of subsistence. They had just enough to eat. So um, the Industrial Revolution creates this mass migration of labor uh, to the big cities, Liverpool, Manchester, London, all of these cities uh, swelled with populations as a result of the Industrial Re Revolution. Um, so um, the idea of freedom and the free market and capitalism and the ability to sell your labor um, was in its own time a very positive force. But now that we are in so-called, you know, late capitalism, um, you know, we have moved on, we've evolved. And now we have a situation um, where uh, this uh, philosophy of uh, greed and, and consumption is ripping civilization apart. It's literally bringing us to the brink of self-destruction. Uh, and as I explained, there are uh, spiritual and societal dimensions of uh, social uh, inequality, which will be dramatically exacerbated um, by uh, automation and technological innovation if the benefits are not uh, shared in society, uh, but also of a global warming and catastrophic climate change. You don't need to be a Nobel Prize laureate to realize that we cannot continue to consume as we have in previous decades. It's almost scientific certainty that we will bring about uh, an appalling apocalyptic future. So in a sense, um, the materialistic uh, sort of uh, idea of unbridled capitalism um, has um, now hit a brick wall <laughs> and it needs to be reimagined. And we can no longer think in simplistic terms about, well, it's either capitalism or communism. Uh, perhaps there are completely different systems in the future that we have not even yet imagined or experienced. Um, so instead of having these simple ideas of, you know, well, capitalism is a lesser evil compared to communism, that sort of tired conversation and debate has to be replaced now by how can we reimagine uh, the sharing economy? Um, how can we uh, create places of work which create a sense of community and fulfillment in which uh, sharing of wealth um, uh, creates uh, a, a better, more harmonious and fulfilling society? And where a living in harmony with nature um, gives us a, a better sense of uh, happiness and fulfillment while preventing our own uh, mass extinction. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, we have a question from, uh, well, I'm not gonna say from, but anyway, uh, I'm going to just read the question out. Uh, the Baha'i writings speak highly about the future of the world and the monarchs that will rise. Baha'u'llah saw advantages to humanity in monarchy, as well as an elected government. Although a Republican form of government prof profiteth all the peoples of the world, yet the majesty of kingship is one of the signs of God. We do not wish that the countries of the world should remain deprived thereof. What paradigm changes are necessary for this to occur? Well, it's a very good question. Uh, and I, I actually had this conversation with my parents just a few days ago. What is meant by kingship? Is it hereditary leadership? Is that what we mean uh, in the future? Or is there a, a different concept uh, of who is a king, who is a ruler? Um, and I don't know the answer to that. Um, I uh, perhaps intuitively feel that the idea of hereditary leadership, perhaps in the past, may have made sense. It provided a stability. There was a 
a, a sort of a personal relation between subjects and a leader, um, but perhaps a more mature um, uh, uh, future society will have a very different idea of leadership, will have a very different idea of who is a king. What if um, those who rose to positions of uh, power were the most selfless, were the, the ones that were the most uh, exemplary in terms of uh, moral leadership? Now, wouldn't that be a change? I mean, think about our political culture. Our political culture rewards uh, narcissism, corruption, greed, selfishness. Someone who is selfless, altruistic, even if they're absolutely brilliant, highly competent, is not going to be rewarded. They're going to be punished by the political system. So perhaps in the future, the king or the queen or whatever, whatever uh, term we will have in the future um, will be someone of exceptional integrity. And uh, in a mature society that instead of blindly worshiping, I don't know, billionaires and Hollywood celebrities, uh, which is a reflection, excuse me, of our own stupidity that we put these people on a pedestal. It's, it's our own fault. If we start uh, elevating uh, people who are exemplary in, in their integrity, I mean, think about the pandemic. Uh, who were the people that we appreciated the most? Were they hedge fund managers and lawyers and bankers? No, they were truck drivers and nurses and the people uh, at the check-in count, uh, at the uh, whatever checkout counter and, and the grocery store. And so, so that's maybe my long answer to say that we need to reimagine the idea of leadership. And my sense is that that is what Baha'u'llah had in mind, that in a spiritual civilization, the cream would rise to the top. <laughs> and um, we wouldn't be thinking about, well, this person is a leader because they were born into privilege. Whether that privilege is a, a, a bloodline, which was the idea of kingship, or um, being born into, I don't know, billionaire family or, or whatever the case may be, this sort of self-perpetuating uh, culture of privilege, which very often uh, has come through uh, corruption and all sorts of questionable means. Thank you, Dr. Ahavan. I'm going to ask my question now because I can. Um, I, I, uh, I wonder if you could uh, comment on the role of law and the rule of law in bringing about uh, a society that is not materialistic and not based on uh, a, a consumerist viewpoint, and and how people who work in that, um, how people who who work in that area can can help to bring that about. Well, it, it, these are excellent questions. And of course, you're asking a lawyer and law professor about the rule of law, but you may be surprised by the answer um, because I think that as, uh, as important as the rule of laws, the basic principle is that nobody is above the law and no one can be against that idea um, because uh, absent the rule of law, well, we have the authoritarian systems where uh, anyone who's in power can abuse and torture and steal and kill and do whatever they want with impunity. Um, but I'd like to go a bit beyond the idea of the law as we understand it as something that's adopted by a legislature and enforced by the police and adjudicated in the courts to think about spiritual laws. Um, so the idea of a law is something which has a definite consequence, right? So if you murder someone in Canada, uh, chances are that you're going to be arrested and prosecuted depending on uh, how well you, know, you cover your tracks. But assuming that the police can find you, you will be prosecuted. That's why the prohibition of murder is a law in that sort of strict positivist sense. But when we look at spirituality, and it goes back to the whole theme of this presentation, 
if you live a life of uh, greed and selfishness and narcissism and what have you, it will have certain consequences. And uh, if society as a whole worships uh, greed and materialism, it will have certain consequences. That's the whole theme of my presentation today, isn't it? That our way of life has brought us to this point of unprecedented alienation and climate catastrophe and so on and so forth, because the world we see around us is a consequence of our belief systems. So getting back to the good society and the rule of law, yes, we need the rule of law, we need a constitution, we need courts, and thank God in Canada, we have one of the most advanced democracies with the rule of law, where you don't have you know, tyrants that can just commit crimes with impunity. But beyond that, we each need to submit to spiritual laws um, so that we are in harmony with the greater, greater forces of creation and with our own uh, noble essence and our own spiritual reality. Um, and what kind of society would that be uh, when we see spirituality as a kind of law um, that we observe not because of the threat of someone catching us or prosecuting us, but because of our own welfare, because we realize that the most selfish thing we can do is to be selfless. Thank you, Dr. Arhavan. Uh, the next question is, there are many who say my truth is different than your truth. Is there a universal truth and how can this be conveyed? An excellent question and a difficult one because uh, as I said earlier, um, when it comes to the independent investigation of truth, everyone has their own unique spiritual journey. And um, it is a big mistake to try and impose your truth on someone else, to judge people, to condemn them uh, uh, because of our own sort of uh, narrow idea of, of, of the truth. And the truth also is perhaps understood best as an inner reality. Uh, the truth is, is it, when you look at fundamentalism and fanaticism, um, which also applies to ideology, it's not just religion. Modern ideologies have the same fanaticism, where there's only one way of looking at the world, and it's a very strict and narrowly defined way, uh, and any deviation from that becomes a heresy. So that, I think, very often gives us the illusion of control and safety in a world that is so chaotic. We want stability, so we hold on to some belief system that has a definite, very clearly defined truth. And that very often is not an inner experience. It's an externalized reality. Um, and it could be just as much the religious fanatic as the politically correct person who engages in virtue signaling rather than actually rolling up their sleeve and going out there and serving people who suffer in the world because it's easy to signal virtue. So why do I say this? Because when you understand that spirituality is that journey uh, or that relation between the lover and the beloved, well, you look at things very differently. You begin to realize that fanaticism um, is ultimately a kind of spiritual bankruptcy. It's because we don't have spiritual depth that we hold on to this very superficial idea of the truth. And because we're insecure about it, we try to impose it on others. And that's part of the problem with our society, that even when we talk about authenticity, we're still very often phony. We're phony about our authenticity because our culture is phony. Our culture is all about superficial appeal. I sometimes think about you know, celebrity activism, for example, how we think, oh, it's so nice to be a human rights activist because this or that Hollywood celebrity who's really sexy uh, uh, you know, 
uh, said so and so on YouTube, and they, you know, whatever, uh, it got a lot of likes on Facebook. It's called slacktivism, right? Because we're slacking, actually. We think that uh, by these superficial gestures, we're a good person because we're lazy. We don't want to do the hard work of spiritual introspection, of suffering, because without suffering, without sacrifice, you cannot grow spiritually. It's a spiritual law. But our culture tells us that everything is about self-indulgence. It's about comfort. It's about avoiding pain and struggle. And ironically, because of that, we have this emptiness and alienation. Isn't it ironic that we need to experience pain and sacrifice and longing and struggle in order to achieve happiness? So this is a roundabout way of saying that if we begin to understand spirituality in that, spirituality in that light, I think the prospect of people trying to impose their truth on others um, becomes much less. The next question is, uh, eco crises are increasing. How can spiritual ecology help us pave a way forward? You know, when I, whenever I think about um, eco crisis, uh, uh, you know, uh, climate change, and uh, you know, I was at COP twenty six in in Glasgow. You know, the UN framework. Convention on Climate Change annual meeting where all the world leaders come to discuss climate change. And it was an incredible experience. There were 30,000 people there from, you know, activists and youth and uh, uh, Greta and, and, you know, all of these, you know, celebrity youth activists, all the way to presidents and, and, you know, heads of state and government and what have you. And it was both promising and shocking. <laughs> it was both promising because there's this new generation that understands so well our relation to nature and the environment and the universe and the consequences of our culture of greed. But on the other hand, many of the world leaders are asleep. They're asleep at the switch. They just don't get it. They just don't understand that anything short of a radical reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, which by extension means radical reduction in consumption and our consumerist way of life um, is going to bring about a catastrophe which we can barely imagine today. And I don't need to discuss here the discussions about whether we're going to have a one and a half degree in temperature rise, three degrees or four degrees, and the catastrophic consequences of massive flooding and extreme weather events and mass starvation, which will come about as a result of um, uh, desertification and droughts and mass migration. You think that we have a lot of people migrating across the Mediterranean and rubber dinghies now? Imagine what's going to happen when we have catastrophic climate change. So all this goes back to our spiritual understanding of our place in the universe. And I understand very well that in history, much of science and technology was about liberating us from the drudgery of survival. The bubonic plague in Europe, 50 million people died because of the Black Plague, because people didn't have basic science. So thank God that we had science, modern medicine, vaccinations, uh, thank God that we've improved food production. So we don't have mass starvation anymore just because we have a drought or bad uh, harvest in, in, in a year. But we have carried that materialistic civilization to excess. And we have forgotten that although we have made significant progress through taming nature, that in a contest between man and mother earth, we are going to lose. So it's time, as I said, for us to realize that we are not at the center of the universe, that all of nature and creation is not there to be exploited endlessly and shamelessly without any conscience. And there's something exciting about this as well as alarming because we are going to be forced, we're being forced 
to understand, as I said earlier, that we are an insignificant speck in an infinite universe. That is one of the essential points of spirituality. It's about humility. It's about learning that we are all interconnected with each other and with the universe. So that's why I think that there is no way, no way to deal with catastrophic climate change except by abandoning our consumerist culture, which isn't just about the politicians that made beautiful speeches at COP26, which were largely empty promises, but it's when the masses rise up and say, we reject this consumerist culture. We're not just a bunch of sheep who are there to just eat and eat and eat. This is a big lie. This is not the way to achieve happiness. And this is leading to our self-destruction. Once we arrive at that consciousness among the masses, uh, then we will be able to uh, address the issue of um, our relation to the environment effectively. Thank you, uh, Dr. Akhavan. I'm wondering if you can comment on the contribution that indigenous culture and indigenous society can make in this um, in this journey uh, towards becoming a non-materialist, non-consumerist culture, a culture that didn't have a concept of ownership uh, before settlers came, um, and a, basically an, an, an anti-consumerist culture? That is a fantastic question. I'm so happy you asked it because it was one of the points that I had mentally noted in my previous answer, but which I forgot. And it reminds me, getting back to um, uh, Abdul Baha's uh, uh, journey to the West, uh, that during his trip to Canada and the United States, uh, he wrote a series of uh, tablets where he referred to the indigenous peoples of the Americas as future spiritual leaders. This is in 1912. This is in 1912. And you can imagine where our indigenous people were then with the residential schools and the legacy of colonial injustice and the sort of racist views that they were somehow, you know, savages because of the relation to nature. And this was the whole idea of the savage, right? In the European modern technologically advanced imagination, savages were still living in a state of nature. And imagine that today, instead of calling that savage, <laughs> we're now beginning to see that it's a question of our survival. Um, so uh, it's incredible to see in Canada, in recent years, the process of truth and reconciliation, beginning with uh, the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which unearthed um, this horrible legacy of the suffering of our uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, indigenous uh, 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 brothers and sisters who still suffer to this day. Um, but beyond this sense of understanding their suffering, also the revival of indigenous cultures. We have an indigenous renaissance today, um, which is incredible because our indigenous communities are maybe just 4% or 5% of the population but their culture has this disproportionate influence on our consciousness. And one of the aspects of that culture is a deep sense of spirituality, a deep sense of the sacred. Um, so we now understand that the relation to nature is hardly about being backward, but actually there is a profound wisdom and intelligence <laughs> in understanding that we are just a part of creation. Uh, even as a scholar, as a legal scholar, I have now you know, many colleagues who are outstanding scholars of indigenous legal system. And in Canada now, law faculties are recognizing indigenous law as a legal system because in the past, only modern societies had legal systems and indigenous peoples didn't have anything because they were pre-modern. And one of the remarkable features, of course, there are many different indigenous cultures. There's not just one, but a kind of generally common feature is a sense of the sacred, the sacred as a source of law, but also legal reasoning is rooted in the earth, literally, 
you look at the earth, you look at the rhythm of the seasons, flora and fauna, and you emulate the patterns of the earth as a means of determining which are the laws that we should follow. And you do it not necessarily through legislatures and formal laws and courts, but in tightly knit communities um, where uh, kith and kinship and a sense of belonging uh, is integral uh, to uh, that sense of our place in the universe. And perhaps one of the original sins of you know, the culture of liberalism, which is very good. Liberalism has given us freedom, democracy. There are many good things. But it also has put the individual at the center of the universe. Everything is about me, my rights, my needs, my desires, my autonomy. And at the end of the day, we realize that, yes, everyone should have their human rights and autonomy respected. But at the end of the day, our happiness, our fulfillment is about belonging. It's about deep connections with others uh, and more widely our wider connection with, with nature. So my prediction is that in the coming generations, indigenous cultures will have an ever more important um, place uh, in our uh, collective consciousness and that more and more of us will begin to emulate um, some of these uh, aspects of uh, uh, spirituality and the sacred and our relation with nature. Thank you so much. And I think this relationship with um, uh, the impact of indigenous culture is, is uh, an important, so important. It's a, it's a great place to end this presentation as we think about that and take that into our uh, into our consciousness. Um, I think Indigenous culture has so many contributions to make, and we have so much work to do to unearth all of all of that and to be able to understand it and, and be a part of uh, a transformation that includes uh, Indigenous culture. So thank you so much. I could, we could be here all night because I just have questions coming in. But um, I think that we only have you for a very prescribed time, Dr. Ahavan. So um, thank you very much, everybody, for being here this evening. Uh, I believe that this, uh, this recording is going to be uploaded um, onto the YouTube channel for the Oakville Baha'is within the next week, um, as are all of the weekly presentations that we have. And um, I'm hoping that Dr. Ahavan will um, be able to come again and speak again because we have, so we, I still have questions coming in. So we have so many questions coming in. Unfortunately, um, you know, we do have a time constraint, uh, but we are hoping that he can come back again and speak perhaps specifically on uh, perhaps indigenous culture and its contributions to world transformation or something um, that, uh, the, an, a continuation of his presentation today. Uh, so thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Ahavan, for being with us this evening. Um, hey, thank, you. thank you for your invitation. Thank you very much. Ms. Masroor, if there's anything just, you would like to add? Yes, I just wanted to thank Payam John very, very, very much. I have seen Payam grow to be a distinct distinguished young man. And I'm glad that at every stage I've been observing this. Thank you for accepting to be here. We love you. We are very, very proud of you. And we hope that you will come back to address uh, these other questions that we have not been able to address tonight, Payam John. Thank you very much. And I see your wonderful daughter, uh, Mariam, uh, laughing because she knows how embarrassed I am. Uh, but it's wonderful to reconnect with uh, two people who've been very special part of my life for so many years. So thank you to 